All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fifth installment of the CTC Running Start series. Um, I am really happy to see you all today. Uh, happy Wednesday. Um, and so I just wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Stephanie Rock. I am the Program Administrator of Dual Credit and Strategic Enrollment Initiatives at the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jamie for introductions. Good morning, everybody. Jamie Traggett, Director of Dual Credit Strategic Enrollment Initiatives at the State Board. Glad to see you all today. Wonderful. And I believe Tim is on as well from OSPI. And so I welcome him to introduce himself. Everybody, Tim McLean, Dual Credit Program Supervisor at OSPI. Wonderful. Well, thank you, everyone. And we're going to go ahead and get started. We've got a lot of great information. Uh, so what we're going to do first is review our agenda for the day. So um, from 9 to 9.30, we will have uh, OSPI updates by our OSPI Dual Credit Program Supervisor, Tim McLean. Uh, what we'll do then is gonna we're going to have a few updates from our department at the State Board Dual Credit Department. Um, and then what we're going to do after that is we're going to jump into breakout sessions midway through our uh, series today. And um, we're going to keep it pretty open ended. We're going to ask, uh, how's it going? How's summer running start going? Uh, so what are some barriers you all are seeing? Um, what's going well? So we're going to be talking summer running start and just get everybody an opportunity to connect for about 20 minutes. And then we'll have a little bit of a debrief for 10 minutes following that. Uh, and then uh, we will have... Um, a session on CTC Link and P223 query that's been in development uh, and running start billing. So we'll be talking about that. We actually have, we'll have Emily Mullins, our reporting and BI solutions analyst for CTC Link joining us. She's been doing really wonderful work uh, putting together a query for us. So really excited to, to show you all um, the query and get feedback and um, see, you know, uh, it, it's not in production yet. So we really uh, are looking forward to, you know, seeing how folks receive it, if there's uh, edits we can make yet. Um, so really looking forward to Emily joining us at 10 o'clock today. And then we'll just have kind of open Q&A session for about a half hour towards the end. Uh, and then feel free to also ask questions as always throughout, drop in the chat, um, you know, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'd be happy to, to answer questions along the way as well. All right. Well, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Tim McLean for updates from OSPI. Thank you, Tim. Sure, my pleasure. Stephanie, you gave me a half an hour. I don't think I'm going to cover that. So hopefully your, your updates can fill in. Um, we haven't had a ton going on since I last saw most of you, but knowing that some um, have come in and out of these sessions, I will just reference the fact that um, our summer running start bulletin has been released. It's out. It went out through the listserv um, at SBCTC. It went out through our listserv at OSPI. Um, the bulletin number is there and it's linked in the PowerPoint. Uh, but that, it, I would hope, answers uh, most all the questions about summer running start. I can acknowledge that uh, my email traffic has slowed um, tremendously since we got that out. Um, so hopefully it's proven helpful to everybody, um, but it's out there and I'll reserve some of my time for questions. Um, if you have any about the bulletin or things that have been popping up around summer running start in general, uh, the bulletin includes all the documents you see listed there, um, everything you should need to do to administer summer, summer running start, both for the after exit proviso funding, as well as um, for traditional or standard running start for students who are under their FTE limits. Um, we've also provided the running start uh, calculator in that document and elsewhere on our website. Um, to make the calculations easier, particularly for the, the schools and districts um, who are filling out those forms on the front end. And as you know, an RSEVF tutorial to um, help the process along even as we get into uh, the academic year. So we are in the home stretch, at least at the K-12 level um, in terms of wrapping up the school year. So I really would encourage you along these lines to make sure you're communicating with your schools and districts about what the process uh, may be heading into the summer months when schools close. I know that's been 
uh, historical challenge since the advent of summer running start. Um, so just uh, be mindful to be reaching out and understanding if those uh, approval lines are going to shift uh, to the district side in the summer or who would be the main point of contact for that. Um, I think that's going to be really crucial in the month ahead. <laughs> Not a month ahead, in the, like three weeks, two weeks ahead. <laughs> Next slide. Um, uh, uh, also related to summer running start, I addressed this with you last time. We have seen an increase to the summer running start rate to account for the fact that there are only two counts during the summer. Um, there has been a rate adjustment to 130 percent the traditional formula-based approach to funding Running Start. Um, I've acknowledged before that's not the 150% that uh, both we and SBCTC had advocated for um, to bring parity to summer and fall, uh, but it's a step in the right direction. Uh, so that is something that you all are certainly aware of and our K-12 uh, partners are, are also familiar with. Um, it still goes out through the traditional apportionment process. Uh, there's no real change in billing, except for the fact that on the district side, that additional 30%, because it was packaged in a proviso, the same proviso from which we get after exit running start, uh, the additional 30% is under a separate revenue code, which is more important for the districts than you, but it is 310 um, is where they'll find that funding. So it's there, it's just in a different place. Um, and then the rate breakdown is below. Um, after exit funding, as you probably know, after a year is a one count, one time lump sum payment from OSPI, um, not the district. So any after exit funding should be uh, requested to Becky McLean, as opposed to being billed to the district. We also talked last time, and uh, I think the word is getting out about the change to running start rates across the board, not only for the upcoming year, but to the current year that can be re applied retroactively. This was a change to the prototypical school funding model. Um, and so what we are seeing now is a need uh, to kind of rebill retroactively what has already been paid. We have been communicating uh, through various methods with school district business offices. At this point, they should be familiar um, with what's occurred and how to remedy that. Um, we've also put out some tools to help both you and the districts calculate uh, that discrepancy. So the tool is linked at the bottom of this screen. Um, the districts are aware that they should be expecting um, requests to true up their their numbers for the year so um, hopefully you're not encountering any resistance to that if you are I highly encourage you to reach out to me or Becky McLean to help resolve any miscommunication uh, that's occurring with districts um, but their business offices know this if their counselors don't so I would um, acknowledge the fact that we have been do we've done a couple running start FAQs just like this with our um, counseling and school district partners. Um, that being said, not all counselors get the same information in the same manner. Um, so if you're having trouble communicating with the counselors, make sure to circle over to the business office that should have gotten this information back in late March. And finally, we've talked also about the RSEVF for next year and our process moving forward. We have a meeting on the books next week to kind of start these conversations around um, what, what can be changed about the RSEVF and the running start enrollment process. What are some of our options going forward? Um, what is some of the feedback that we've already received from colleges and school districts about the RSEVF? Um, we're going to be diving into that in May, as promised. Um, we will put out a more formal call for revisions in October of 24, 
and um, we will continue to work on uh, the RSEVF and the enrollment process for next year um, as we get that feedback in fall and winter of uh, this upcoming year. Um, again, there are no changes of substance to the RSEVF from this year. So if school districts have already processed RSEVFs using for the fall using the 23-24 form. Um, that form is going to look the same as what we have more recently released for next year. It should be accepted. Um, and again, we've provided resources for the districts to help them improve their um, their processes around uh, completing the RSEVF. Um, I believe that was my last slide, but there was one more topic I wanted to dive into if that was not my last slide. That was your last slide, Tim, but yes, go ahead. Please continue. <laughs> um, one, one last thing I, I wanted to address um, that I don't think I've touched on in past sessions is um, that I have been doing a lot of intervention on behalf of colleges with school districts. I've really made it a priority uh, in the last year, but particularly over the last like four months to be very responsive to reaching out to districts as we've had sessions like this and, and concerns have arisen from the college. What I'm finding almost without fail in these is that oftentimes the districts feel blindsided. They feel very unaware um, that there are issues and, and my intervention comes as a surprise to them. They often say we haven't heard from the college about this issue. So I, I have talked with Stephanie and Jamie about this um, and I really want to encourage everybody to ensure that before concerns are elevated to me or even SBCTC at a state level, that there has been a sufficient amount of interaction between the college and the school to ensure that they've had a chance to respond to address or remedy any challenges that you may have um, and I and I say this because it, it has been fairly consistent in in each outreach that I've made that they've felt um, that this this was somewhat coming out of left field. So I I want to make sure, and I want you to expect as you're coming to me with some of these that I am going to ask some of those questions about what state steps have been taken um, to address issues directly with the high schools or colleges. I am always happy to consult if there's a if there's an issue that arises um, that you want me to be aware of or that you want Stephanie or Jamie to be aware of. I'm not saying don't reach out to me. Uh, what I am saying is that I would really appreciate when you do so that you give me a little bit more context as to what conversations have been had, who you've spoken to, dates, details, whatever you can give me. So that when I go into those conversations, I I have a uh, the context and the landscape for what's going on and can speak to that. So uh, just recognize that I may push back a little bit um, to gather more information when these requests to intervene come up, only because I think my most recent interactions and there are many. I, I'm not talking about one or two. Those of you who are on the call may have already engaged with me on some of these. I'm not talking about any one college specifically. It has been pretty generalized that when I've called, I don't think it has always helped the relationship in the in the initial conversation. I think we've gotten there over several interactions, but um, I, I think that it has created some tension between schools and um, colleges when that happens, because they think that the OSPI interaction uh, isn't always technical assistance um, until after the conversation. I think oftentimes they think um, that they're in trouble with me, and that's certainly not the way I approach any of these conversations. But I wanted to put that out there and just let you all know that if you're, I, I am not suggesting I am not there to help or to facilitate or to bring partners together. I just want to make sure that there have been some steps taken before um, I intervene. So that being said, I saw a couple, uh, I did not read them, but I saw a couple of questions pop in the chat. Let's 
Let's see. Request for the slide deck that's there. Uh, In the future, with the summer running start, can you include July and August on the calculator? I have a student taking courses through the high school and through running, running start. Um, I'm not, I'll have to consult with Becky on that. When it comes to running start um, for the summertime, I'm not sure we can proactively know what a student is going to be taking in the summer. Uh, the purpose of the calculator is to ensure that they have the that they have the FTE going into the summer. But I've said this before, we can't split FTE in a way in which we're presuming that they're taking something at the high school or at the college. Um, so if um, Karen, you want to elaborate on on the difficulty there, I'd be happy to bring it to Becky. Uh, but the, and this may all change as we dive into the running start, um, uh, the RSEVF in general. But um, generally, we can't presume that we know what their FTE is in the summer. Um, the purpose of the summer RSEVF is simply to ensure that they have the FTE going in. Okay, I know that there's lots of emails regarding the student that we're having coming into the summer. So I know Becky was part of that chain. So we have kind of figured out what the student can do in the summer, but it was, yeah, pretty cumbersome for a while there figuring out how to determine what she was going to be eligible for based by what classes she was planning on taking in the summer at through her high school. Gotcha. Yeah, but we're definitely not filling the, the form won't be filled out until she actually gets enrolled in those classes and stuff. But we have some, if she was taking full time there or what she was doing, what she would be eligible. So we we have a mock one made up. Yeah, I, I okay, I'm, I'm hearing that. Um, I think that that's a unique situation. The vast majority of our students aren't taking high school classes in the summer. Um, so I think you're right on in terms of needing to know and have them registered at that point before we can figure that out. Um, but I'll see if that's something that could be incorporated um, into that tool. But thanks for that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, can we go over the after exit forms? Um, Sure. So when it comes to after exit, what, what we need the students to be doing first and foremost is, is taking the after exit, or not taking it, but getting it, the after exit declaration of intent from their high school. That is intended to signal to the high school, one, that this student intends to, to do summer running start and it's a means for the school to establish their eligibility to ensure that they uh, have the FTE available or in the case of graduating students, we need to ensure that the high school is signaling this is a graduating student that they've met their graduation requirements. What it also does is it allows our high schools to ensure that that record is kept open through the course of the summer. It's especially important for graduating seniors because once the record is closed, it can't be retroactively adjusted. So a senior who has graduated or is poised to graduate and chooses to take summer running start, we need the district to know that student is doing that in order to transcribe those. So once they get that completed at the high school, we've strongly recommended that the high school send that with the student over to the college so the college has those those boxes checked knowing that the student is eligible for the high school and um, that they have made those um, efforts to inform the high school of their intention and then for the college all we need for after exit is that assurances document completed once that's essentially a cover page to the report that you're going to generate out of CTC link of all the summer, uh, all the after exit students that you have um, to report for funding. So to be clear, 
that assurances document does not need to be completed for each and every student. That's essentially just the cover page with our expectations of how that funding was used. It's an assurance that says, we checked these students are within 15 credits. We checked to make sure that we had documentation from the high school that they were eligible. Um, and these are the students we're requesting payment for. So it's a one-time form that accompanies the report generated out of CTC Link that I know Stephanie and Jamie did a lot of work to, to code and, and work with IT to make sure that that report can be run and that it'll be simple and easy. So once you have that report, you send it to um, Becky McLean direct. I don't have the bulletin in front of me. I think it's August 15th-ish um, is the deadline by which that has to be submitted. And it needs to be really clear um, that that deadline needs to be met. Once we close the books, we can't go back and, and add somebody um, after the fact. We can't go adjust and go, oh, we did this one out under FTE. Can we switch it to after exit? Um, this is a static proviso, so we have to have these students funded um, by the end of the fiscal year. We can't retroactively look back a couple months from now and correct. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Um, I also just put another question in the chat um, about like what that query is um, or where I can find that said magical query. <laughs> that would be for Jamie or Stephanie. Yeah, great question. Um, so you would want to put the BAE service indicator on all of your after exit students for the summer, effective before the start of your summer quarter. Um, and then when you pull the billings, the running start billing report, that service indicator should be indicated on the running start billing report so you can identify your after exit students. Mm -hmm. Um, I will during our breakout session, I will pull up um the reference center um, link that has all of that information for everyone. And I'll put it in the chat um, after we get back from our breakout session. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's well, of course. so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Other questions for Tim? All right. And Tim, are you, remind me again, are you sticking on uh, for the rest of the session or did you need to, to jump off? Um, I would be, I was looking at my calendar. Um, I would be happy to jump back on if, if you'd like for the FAQ in case, or uh, Q and A rather, in case anything pop comes up that. Okay. You can yeah, that would be great. Before. Okay. Sounds great. Great. All right. Oh, and then can the BA service uh, indicator, BAE service indicator be released after a certain period of time? Um, I am trying to remember. I did this last year. <laughs> can anyone remember? I, I'd have to look back in the reference center document. Um, or Jamie, do you know the answer to that one? No. Um, okay. When we look we'll, at we'll... the, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if it's reference, if that's in there or not, but we can check and, and follow back up if it's not. Oh, Jane, Jane Berry oh. has a, you set the end term summer 2024. Okay, thank you. I couldn't remember. <laughs> it's been a little while since I've been in there. Um, thank you. And we'll, we'll yeah, perfect. We are putting a start and end date of summer 24. Okay, perfect. Thank you, everyone. Oh, this is just wonderful. I love when everyone comes together so we can troubleshoot together. What Jane said, okay, since, cool. <laughs> since we're talking about end dates, um, I don't want to oversell it. I do think the constant reminders are helpful and many of you probably have heard this. Um, the, the after exit piece of summer running start, we know it's challenging. Um, and we also know it, it may not be forever. I just want that. I say this all the time because I want to be clear. This is a proviso. Um, it can come or go, um, based upon the legislative sponsor year after year. This is currently the last year in which it's in effect, um, so just I want everybody to be prepared for that in their conversations with students that this may not always be an opportunity that's available. The whole purpose of the 1.4 FTE uh, increase was kind of to eliminate this issue, to make it easier for students to get 
within the A uh, to to accomplish achieve an AA while in high school without needing to go over FTE without needing to go into uh, another summer or have these after exit funds available. So um, frankly, I thought it was going away when that move happened and it didn't. Um, I still think it will inevitably go away. So for you all to know in your planning purposes and your conversations with students, make sure that they know that this is not a guaranteed opportunity in future years. Yes, thank you, Tim. All right, any last uh, questions for Tim at this point? I'll be happy to jump back on, like I said, um, after you've had further conversations, if anything is generated through those, I'll be back. Okay, thank you, Tim, so much. Appreciate it. Stephanie, right. do you just want to drop me an email or ping me or Jamie, you can yep. text oh, me. I, if, I can text you. Yeah, Perfect. just text me and say, hey, hop back on. We're ready. <laughs> okay, good. sounds good. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, all. All right, everyone. Um, so we just had a couple updates and um, not, not anything new uh, from our... Uh, SBCTC dual credit uh, department. Um, so just a uh, just kind of a recap, a reminder about the math placement project grant that has been um, been going on this whole school year since um, fall of 2023. Uh, basically, what we have been doing is we've created a high school transcript uh, grid uh, placement grid. Um, and we are at the point now we've had three different convenings uh, and we're at the point right now where we are getting our pilot colleges on board. Um, we've already we have uh, several colleges on board and we're, we're working with a few additional colleges. So the reason I'm uh, bringing this up is because I think it's great work that we're doing. What we're trying to do is create a universal high school transcript placement grid. Uh, and our hope is that everyone system wide will eventually use it for their students. Um, and so I encourage everyone, if you haven't yet, to, to go to our webpage that we have and take a look at our guidance document. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to reach out to myself. Um, and all that information is on the webpage as well. Uh, but, you know, the again, the intent is that, you know, a student trying to create equity, you know, system wide, if a student goes to um, one community technical college, they'll be able to place the same as if they go to a neighboring community technical college based on their high school transcripts. So um, it's exciting work and it's been kind of a starting point for a lot of placement conversations statewide. And we're really excited to see where we can go and how we can evolve uh, this placement grant moving forward. So um, the pilot colleges do get um, a bit of money as well, funding. So please reach out to me um, if you do have any interest or have additional questions. Um, and then just uh, real quick, I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have our uh, dual credit YouTube playlist. So we will put, we have been putting all of our series on there, our recordings after they're complete. Uh, and so um, just a reminder, and then there's the direct link there so people can access that. All right, and that's all we have in terms of updates. And it looks like we're, we're doing really good on time actually. Um, I'll pause though. Does anybody have any questions before I move on to um, our breakout session for today? All right, we will move on here. Okay, so for today, as I mentioned earlier, what we're gonna do is just kind of talk summer running start like we have been pretty much uh, this morning so far. How's it going? Uh, are there any barriers that you all are running into? Um, just a chance for programs to connect. Uh, we'll take about 20 minutes um, and then we'll debrief for about maybe eight minutes afterwards. And then we'll come back together um, debrief, and then Emily Mullins will be joining us to talk about the P223 query that's in development, which is really exciting. So um, let's go ahead and- Stephanie, I've got the breakout room set up, if that works for you. You're amazing, Jamie. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, <laughs> I, and, uh, I know how sometimes it's easy to want to skip out on the breakout. Just if you are going to skip out, come back, because we really want to make sure, like Stephanie said, that you're here to hear Emily, um, because that is key to the work. So if, if you're not feeling social, just make sure you're back by by 10 o'clock. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm going to go ahead and um, oh, yeah. Uh, and then let me create these guys. You said 20 minutes, right? Yeah, we'll do like 20 minutes and then debrief for maybe seven. Um, just okay. so we're right at time for Emily. Let me at 10. just make sure I've got that. 
and then we'll just pop in and out of them just to hear what's what's going on but all right i think we're good okay thank you i have a quick question sorry um so with the after exit declaration for seniors that qualify um are we sending those forms directly to Becky McLean? Is that correct? Uh, one second. At the after exit declaration. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So what goes to Becky McLean is the assurance form for after exit. And then um, basically who you're claiming for after exit. Okay. And I just put um, in the in the chat for everyone um, the Running Start CTC Link uh, Reference Center um, for after exit. So the um, the specific query that you'll pull for the BAE service indicator is there, and then you'll cross reference that with the Running Start billing report uh, to get your after exit students. So the instructions are right there. Um, I I know that I had promised to get that um, while we were in breakout session, so I just wanted to share that um, for for folks, um, just as a kind of a tutorial from our side of the house. But the de the declar the after exit declaration form is something that um, you keep. Um, but feel free to chime in, others, um, if you have like a process that you've developed at your college. And then we had we had one of our high schools ask um, with the summer EVF these for homeschool students that are brand new to Running Start coming in rising juniors um, they they had applied to the high school for for being enrolled in the fall and so the high school didn't know when to activate the student. Um, when they were wanting to do summer quarter um, on their end. So I was trying to help her figure that out, um, but we're really not sure. We don't have a clear answer um, on what the high schools are supposed to be doing with those particular students, their homeschool. So they're kind of unique. And just to clarify, they wanna take summer running start, right? To yeah. start off with. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm looking kind of over towards Jamie on that one. Do you have any recommendations on how they could work with the district mm -hmm. on that? Can you repeat? I was texting Tim. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> Not bad. sorry, Jamie. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat? I'm sorry. Could you just repeat one more time? I can't. I'm terrible at both. <laughs> you want me to repeat? Do you mind yeah. just the last? Okay. Yeah, sorry. So in the case of homeschool students that are coming in as rising juniors to the high school, they're registering with the high school. Well, the high school is registering them for fall. And and so the high school doesn't know when they need to activate them if they're wanting to do summer quarter to start. Is there a date that the high school should be activating students? I know that, that students that are um, rising seniors, there's no issue because it's a continuation of the, the, the year that they have finished. But with these homeschool students that are coming in as new um, to running start, the high school is, one of our high schools is having trouble deciding when to activate them in their system. And do we mean activate of like how they're determining their grade level? And so, because and that, oh, go ahead. assuming everything they have to know. I know they don't need FTE, but I'm assuming it's grade level. We could double check with Tim, but my thinking is that they would just they would need to um, assess and confirm that they are basically at the level of being done with their sophomore year, ready their junior, and then they would tech it's. This is where I would probably have Tim or maybe Becky because they're technically it's sophomore activation, like because it's the end of that sophomore FTE. It hasn't the the junior hasn't kicked in, so they shouldn't be doing fall. It should be it should be before that in the summer. So like basically the tail end of their sophomore year. But I may not be using the exact right words, and we can we can save that when Tim gets back. 
I think that's a good idea because that's what, sorry, Jamie, to put you on the spot. That's kind of what I was thinking. I wasn't sure if we have the answer to that one or not. Yeah, Don, let's, let's ask Tim when he gets back on. Okay. Sorry to make that's you a repeat. great question. No, <laughs> yeah. That's okay. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Um, feedback from your breakout session, other additional questions that have come up. That's really great. Um, we can take a couple minutes. Um, and I know Emily just jumped on, so we're excited for Emily's bit too here in a minute. Yeah, Heather. Yeah, so we had a discussion a little bit about, um, so I've been starting to run like our summer and fall billing just to kind of confirm, you know, which of our students are enrolled. And I'm finding that the, you know, because we also keep like a little tracking list and we mark when our students are enrolled when we're meeting with them and things like that. Um, but a lot of our students are not showing up on that billing report yet. And I'm just kind of wondering what the issue may be. And if there's any thoughts on that <laughs> and if anybody else is running into the same issue and, and uh, people in my group quickly ran their, their reports and they are finding that they are also missing students. So um, I personally think it has something to do with the tuition calculation um, not running properly. Um, I've noticed in the past if you uh, if the tuition calculation hasn't been been ran for the students that they they won't show up on that billing report. So they're not showing up for fall. You're trying to run it for fall. Is that my Correct. understanding? I'm running okay. it for, for both fall. summer and fall, and the students are not showing up on on the billing report for either for either okay. i have very few i have a few students that are showing up but not not everyone the hundreds that that should be showing up heather are you able to give um I, i'm any additional information in an email that stephanie can follow up with brandon because any like details that we can send it's much easier for them to dive in and see what's yeah. going on yeah, I sent an, an email to my IT department too. So hopefully okay. they're going to be working more with the state, but I thought I would also bring it up here. Um, my, my dream hope would be that the, the state would come up with this magical job that we could run that would do a tuition calculation for all running start students that we could run right before we run our, our billing reports so that it catches all of the students who may be doing any last minute schedule changes or you know get in from wait lists at you know at the start of the quarter things like that so that we can catch all of those those credits and FTEs. Heather, Heather just had to, it. Oh, oh I'm so sorry, sorry. Just to clarify, no, do you does your college one of those that um uh deactivates the student group at the end of the summer or at the end of spring? Do you deactivate the student group by then? No, no, so the student even... groups are all active still mm -hmm. because okay. they're still going to be continuing on. Um, and we don't know which students are going to be, you know, taking summer classes or not. So I leave them them active. Okay, and then also um, to you, is it, are you currently in your enrollment period or have students been enrolling classes and then and they should be okay? Yeah, yeah, they're, we're in our enrollment period. They're all enrolling. Um, they don't, students don't enroll until they meet with us. And so we can go in, um, you know, and we can see in their running start screen that yes, they're enrolled, but they're not, they're not showing up unless we hit that tuition calculation. And Heather, had you ran a report prior? I know we we're just now enrolling, right, for, for summer and fall. Had you ran a report prior and students were showing up, or this was the first time that you ran it and you're noticing students are not there that should be? Um, so I ran it like a, a week ago, mm -hmm. um, like the day after students were allowed to, to enroll to see which one of our, you know, which of our students had enrolled and not a lot had enrolled. So I was like, okay. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll just wait until, uh, you know, Monday uh, to see, you know, make sure that the tuition, you know, calculation had 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 ran and still not a lot of students had enrolled. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, if you could 
please email myself and Jamie with all the details that you can provide, like Jamie suggested, then we can totally elevate this and, and kind of see what's going on and work with our student financials team. Um, thank you for bringing this up. And it sounds like others are having that issue too. So we'll, we'll kind of see what's going on. Thank all you. Right, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, well, I want to be mindful of time and I know that uh, Emily is here. Um, so I'm really excited for Emily to do a demo here of the query that she has created uh, in regards to the P223 and the Running Start Billing Report. Um, so I am really excited to introduce Emily Mullins. Uh, thank you, Emily, for joining us today. And um, she's our reporting and BI solutions analyst for CTC Link. And she's been working with uh, myself and Jamie uh, to develop this, um, this query based on the P223 report. So thank you, Emily, and let us know how we can help support you. Stephanie, can I step in for one sec? I just yes. wanted to tell everybody that like this, I want to say thank you to Stephanie and Emily. I'm not claiming any of this. Stephanie has done an amazing job. And this is all coming from all of your requests and really wanting something more simplified and easy and consistent. So this may not, you know, we're really wanting to information gather, but I just want to throw some kudos because um, Stephanie's been on it and Emily's been amazing to work with. So we're really hoping you'll be excited and then also share with us what what needs to be tweaked or maybe maybe we're good to go. So I just had to plug that in. So thank you, Jamie. Embarrass Stephanie. No, yeah. <laughs> she knows I don't like that. <laughs> All right, Emily, thank you so much. Let us know how we can help support as you do your presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jamie and Stephanie. Um, so that was a great intro introduction. Um, you've already listed off my very long title here, so I'm not going to repeat that. Um, I was just going to say that I am on the reporting team at the state board, so I don't know if we have any um, query developers that are in the audience today. If so, you may have worked with me before if you've you know worked with queries in CTC Link or submitted them for migration. Um, if not, there may just be some query users in the audience, and that's fine too, because um, I definitely have a query that I'm going to go over with you all today. So when I met with Stephanie and Jamie, um, they introduced me to the P223 report, which I had not seen before, um, but that is a report that it sounds like um, is being used for the district billing for Running Start. Um, and my understanding is that many colleges have been running a query that already exists in CTC Link, which is the QCS SRRS billing query. And it sounds like there's this tedious process of paring down the results to get the data that is needed to submit externally for the P223 report. Um, and so I just had some conversations with them about how we could tweak this query, essentially creating a new query that would have the data that's needed for that report. And then along the way, I discovered that this query could also be used for some of the communication and tracking that needs to be done for the specific high schools on which students are enrolled um, for Running Start. And so essentially I have a query I'll be demoing today and trying to get everyone's feedback. Um, that can be used for both of those purposes. Um, so the name of the query is just like, again, I don't know if I have any query developers in the audience, you would be familiar with the prefix that we use when we're just developing a query in our testing environment, which is PCD. So I have a query that's dev underscore QCS SR RS billing, and then it ends in HS to distinguish it because that stands for high school. Um, so this query can be run by high school district and or high school. Um, and then it has all of the fields that are needed for the P223 report. Um, so I'm just gonna go in, I have a lot of different things I'm gonna be like, I might be switching back and forth to different screens um, to show you all some different things today. So just bear with me on that. Um, I am more used to using WebEx, so give me one second. Okay, share. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes. Oh, good. I was like, I'm hoping. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. Yes. <laughs> okay. 
Um, so I've got the query open here, which like I said, it can be used. This query will be able to be used for a couple different things. So I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, and of course it's gonna be slow. Okay. Um, so I just clicked run and this is where the different prompts pop up. So as those of you who are familiar with the original RS billing query, that query only has the first two prompts. So just for the college and the term. But as you can see, I've added two prompts here at the end for the high school district and then the um, high school itself. Um, so I've just got some default prompt values in here. Um, I don't know if we have anyone here today from Tacoma Community College, but that's just who I am using today for demo purposes. Um, and then for the winter term of this year. Um, and then just wanted to make a quick note about how there are these codes being used for the high school district code. Um, this was just the easiest way to set it up in the query rather than to have people, for example, type out, you know, Peninsula High School District or Peninsula High School. That's obviously a lot of letters. It's a lot of room for error if you spell it incorrectly. Um, so for this, we are going to use a code, but I did want to point out that I don't expect you all to have all of these codes memorized. So it's really nice about the prompt is you can click on this little um, magnifying glass. And so that way, if you don't have the district code memorized, it will look it up for you. Um, so this is really nice. So in this instance, it just gives a nice list. Um, you can also do some searching up here. Like if you know that it's Peninsula, you can type in Peninsula and it'll narrow it down and then you can click on the correct code. Um, get out of that. And then same thing for the high school code. Um, this is an external org ID and they all, at least all the ones that I've seen begin with uh, three zeros for the high school. Um, so it may seem silly. You're probably like used to seeing this, these six digits, but that's just, I put a note in here to make sure the first three zeros are entered. So the same thing here, there's a magnifying glass where you can use the lookup. Um, if you don't readily know the external org ID of the high school that you wanna run the query for, this is where you can look it up. And same thing, you can do a search on the word and then it'll pop up. Um, and then you just select the code. So, I'm going to go ahead and run the query. And just again, in case anyone from TCC is here today, I have redacted student names and IDs from the results. So we're not going to be seeing any like personally identifiable information for students, just for this example. Um, okay, so these are the query results. And again, I did have to put some sort of an ID in here for students, but it's like, not their Impl ID. I just needed that so that I could see, you know, the first three rows are one student, the next three rows are for the next student. So in the version of this query that will be made available for colleges to run, student ID numbers, student names will be added in. Again, I just redacted those for the purposes of this demo. Um, so I put the fields in the order that they appear in a spreadsheet that I believe Jamie and Stephanie shared with me when they were asking me to develop a query that was similar to the spreadsheet. So I will just go ahead and open that. Again, I've blinked out like student names and things like that. Um, so this was a spreadsheet that was provided that I guess, um, and I do think someone at TCC was creating a spreadsheet like this for Running Start students. So. Again, they were pulling it for Peninsula School District, Peninsula High School. And then these are really the only fields that were needed. And I believe this is not for the P223 report. I believe this is for the communication and tracking that's done of the Running Start students. But somebody can jump in and correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, so these are the fields that are needed in the query. And then um, so... I'm just going to jump back over to the query now. Um, just want folks to pay special attention to how in the query, you know, you start out with these, like we've got 
um, academic units, and then there's like a sum of the academic units. So anytime you see sum in the name of the fields in this query, um, just be really mindful that that the that sum should never be added together. So let me give you an example. The first three rows here that we're looking at for a student, um, this particular student in the this past winter quarter took, it looks like three classes and then only two of them carried academic units. So the first one had five units, second one didn't have any academic units, and then the third had five units. So that's where you're seeing in this next column over um, that there's the sum of their academic units sums to 10. And so that's where you're getting the five plus the five. So again, you're going to, because of the way the formulas work in CTC link and the query, you are going to see that 10 summed in every row for that student. Um, but just with the knowledge that 10 should never be added together, like to be 30 or anything like that for that student. So that is where it's a little bit different from the spreadsheet that I was given because whoever set up this spreadsheet set it up to basically have like a subtotal row underneath each student's data. And so that's where like for this student, you're seeing, you know, they have five, five and five for the three classes of academic units. And then that sums to 15 here. Um, and so again, just with the way that the query works, that has to be set up a little bit differently. Um, and then you'll also see that that was done here for the vocational units. In this instance, the student didn't have any, but if you jump down to this student, it looks like they had a total of three vocational units. Um, so again, going back to the query, um, over here, it shows the student's vocational units. Um, they had one, class that had the five vocational units. So in the sum column here, every row will say that they had five vocational units because that's just a sum. Um, let's see, okay, so now I wanted to talk about um, how some of the numbers work with like the high school counts. So that was something that I saw. These are the final columns in this spreadsheet. So it's the high school count for grade 11, and then the high school count for grade 12, and then the total high school count. So you'll see here um, in this column that it shows which grade the students are in. So they're in grade 11. And then if you look at these, that is that is why this is zero um, over here for the high school count of 12, because it doesn't apply to this particular student. This student is in grade 11. Um, but then if you were to scroll down in the results, I'm like, eventually I thought we would get <laughs> to a student who was in 12th grade. There we go. Okay, so this is where it starts being populated once we get to students who are in 12th grade then it kind of does the reverse. The column for 11th grade is zero and then the column for 12th grade is 82. Um, but this column for the total high school count is always 145. Um, that's essentially the 63 and the 82 being added together. Um, so that, just to go back to the query, you'll notice that those numbers are in these columns. So same thing, instead of having a zero in the query, it just comes across as blank. And then once you scroll down and get to students who are in the 12th grade, it's blank in the column for the 11th grade, but then it's 82 for the 12th grade column. Um, so my understanding for those numbers is not only for them to be included in this spreadsheet, but I was also given this, um, spreadsheet that looks like, you know, some aggregate numbers that folks at the colleges are putting together. And this is where it really comes into play for the P223 report. So hey, just Emily, wanted, yeah. it's Stephanie, I just want to interrupt you really quickly. Um, it, it doesn't look like your screen is switching back and forth between the Excel and the query. I think everyone for the most part has been following so far, but when you're showing those, um, those P223 numbers, the, the totals, we're not able to see that part. I don't know why it's not <laughs> jumping over for you. So Might wait, to, what are um, you guys seeing right now? Are you in the query? 
Yeah, we're on the query. It just stays on the query, which I think everyone's following because um, everything was making sense that you were saying. But just for the um, the Excel, I think that you're trying to show now the totals. We can't see that part. Well, that's weird because I didn't, I clicked share screen because I wanted like anything that's on my screen to show, not just that browser. So I, again, like I'm not as used to using Zoom. So <laughs> Um, yeah, I was just letting you know that part of it. I, yeah, I think it's okay though. I think everyone's following so far. No, um, and for me, like I really need to show you guys the exam. <laughs> I mean, there's, I, there's, it's not going to make sense if I don't show you the Excel. So okay. essentially, in WebEx, it's not looking like this is an option. Maybe uh, unshare your screen and then share again with the Excel. Unless anybody else has any other suggestions. Because I know in WebEx, there's an option. Like I share just the screen, but this is not. It should usually the option for this. It's the first option. Okay, there we go. That's what I thought I had clicked. That's really weird. I don't there know. we go. <laughs> okay, sorry about that, you guys. No, I'm it's okay. Thank you, Emily. I thought this whole time. Okay, so you guys <laughs> have never seen this screen that I've been sharing. Right. Yep. Okay. Sorry about that. So I'll go back to just really quickly. All I pointed out in this spreadsheet was the subtotal row. So like whoever created this spreadsheet basically gave a blank row for students so that the sum of the academic units was showing underneath just the one time. Whereas in the query, we don't have a way to set it up that way because of CTC link. That's why in the query, it has to go in its own column to the right of this data. And then same thing for the vocational units. Um, in this spreadsheet, it's summed below the rows, but in the query, it has to be um, summed out to the side. And, and that's why it looks like that in the query. So it is a little bit different. Um, and then I talked about these high school columns. Um, those do look pretty similar with the exception in this spreadsheet. You see a bunch of zeros if they're in the 11th grade, um, whereas in the query, um, it's just blank. So you'd scroll down and see 63. And then 82. Okay. So this is where now I need to demo the other spreadsheet, which is where um, the aggregate numbers are to know like where these numbers from the query would get plugged in. So again, using uh, Tacoma Community College as an example, and then them filling it in for Peninsula High School, which I just put in red here. So this is where that number 63 for the total headcount for the 11th grade would be plugged in. And this is where 82 total headcount for the 12th grade would be plugged in. So that's where those two numbers from the query are being put in. And then again, it looks like whoever created the spreadsheet created some sum formulas here so that there's like a total by grade so that all these, you know, adds up to 191. These are 223. So essentially what that, that person could do with this query is they would run it for um, the Peninsula School District, Gig Harbor High School, then Henderson Bay, and then Peninsula High School, and then fill in these um, cells with the data that comes from the query. And then it does some summing here with the totals by grade. And then that would get plugged in to the P223 report at the top part because that's where you get, you know, this running start head count by district, by the 11th grade, by the 12th grade, and then it has the totals here. So that's just a little demo of how you can use the numbers and the queries, plug them in to get data that's needed for certain sections of the P223 report. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back to the query, Let's see. Sorry, I know I'm switching around a lot, but there's a lot to cover. Um, so now I just wanna go back to, back a few columns where we have the sum of the academic units, the academic FTE. Um, so that's here, academic units, sum of academic FTE, sum of vocational units, and then sum of the vocational FTE. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about the sum of the academic units. This is where, you know, if a student is taking two classes, like in this instance, they each have five academic units, it's gonna show 10 in each of those rows for that student. Then when you get to an academic FTE, this column, this was something that was brought to my attention by Jamie and Stephanie. 
that rounding is very, very important here to when this reporting is done because it has to be rounded to the nearest two decimals and that that impacts all sorts of things with regard to billing. Um, so I did put a formula in the query to make sure that this that these FTEs round appropriately. Um, so again, you'll see that for this student, they were given an academic FTE of 0.33 for this first class, um, nothing for the second class, and then 0.33 for the last one. And then that gets rounded to 0.67 for their academic FTE. Um, and then jumping over to their vocational units, um, it again has their vocational units and then the corresponding, um, or sorry, here's the, they said so they had one class that has 0.33 vocational FTE. And so then it sums their vocational FTE to 0.33. So my understanding is that there is a spreadsheet like this that colleges are using. And I, again, have blocked out names of students, but just pretend that there's a student name in each of these rows. Um, and then that's where the sum of the academic units, academic FTE, vocational units, and vocational FTE is going. And then I believe I heard that folks were printing off this spreadsheet and submitting it, basically attaching it to the P223 report to fill out this section here. So essentially the student name, put what grade they're in, and then you're filling out for their credits FTE. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that how this was being done in the past is there was this very complicated formula for rounding. I don't know if you all can see this, it's probably really small, <laughs> um, but there was this super complicated formula to make sure everything got rounded correctly. And so now that is no longer needed in the Excel file because the query is set up in a way to make sure that those units round appropriately um, to the nearest second decimal point. So that accomplishes this part. And then I guess the last thing I need to show um, is the SIP code. So that's just a field that I added in. I am open to feedback about like moving this field because I just realized it's kind of in the middle of a bunch of other fields right now. Um, like it's kind of wedged here in between these like total high school count and then some of these, you know, some of the clinical academic FTE for grade. Um, but I noticed that that was a field that was needed for each student in each class that they're enrolled in. And it goes here in this final column in the P223 report. So let me know if you think that field should maybe be moved to the very end. I can certainly move it there. Um, but I did add that field as well. Um, and I think this is the last part that I forgot to talk about, but these, the sum of the academic FTE for the grade levels. So again, this is where you're gonna see it'll be blank if you're looking at a student who's in the 11th grade, then it'll be blank for the 12th grade column until you scroll down and get to a student who's in the 12th grade, then those fields will be populated. Um, and I believe these numbers are also used here. Yeah, so this is where you're populating academic FTE for 11th and 12th and then vocational FTE for 11th and 12th for each college. So that's where those numbers would go. And then they would also go in this top part of the P223 report. Um, yeah, so I think that was it. Again, I know this is, I jumped around quite a bit because I was showing like different fields that go where. Um, I was also trying to show that this one query that I developed can be used for multiple different purposes. So it can be used to fill out the P223 report, but it can also be used to replace this spreadsheet that somebody developed in Excel and did all these different subtotals um, just for the tracking of the students. So yeah, I'm going to stop there. I've been talking for a bit and just, you know, I covered a lot. So just to see if anybody has any questions. Emily, I just want to say thank you so much, like on behalf of literally everybody. I can't even tell you how much time this will 
save us. Seriously. Oh, so oh, that's great. This is huge. Thank you so, so much. Yeah. You are welcome. Yeah, Emily, you're amazing. And the one thing I see Heather Ashley um, put in the the chat here, it was a question, and I'm trying to remember what you and I and Jamie had talked about with this. With the query, do we have to run it by each high school or can we run it for all our high schools at once? I thought we were talking about being able to do it by district, um, but correct me, I can't remember what we had discussed on that one. Yeah, that's a great question. So that goes back to these prompts that I demoed in the beginning. Um, so I haven't done this yet just because I have, I've plugged in some default values because I essentially I was entering the same code every time I, I ran this query for testing. Um, but what I can do, actually, I'm going to go into the high school one. I am going to make this prompt optional, which it won't let me check that if, as long as I have a default value. So I'm just going to remove this. Um, and now it's going to let me make it optional. So for the purposes of this example, now we are going to run it as though we're at TCC in the winter term and we just run it. We want to run it for the Peninsula High School District, but we want all of the high schools within that district to return in the results. Now that I've made this last prompt optional, it should let me do that. So I'm going to click OK, and obviously it's going to generate more results now than it did before because it'll be, I believe, three different high schools will be in here. Yeah, so this is where you'll see, you know, at the beginning, we've got the results for Gig Harbor High School. Um, beautiful. And then so, there should be the, yes, so there should be Henderson in here and then Peninsula as well. So yeah. Yeah, it's kind of mixed in, in between. Yeah, here's Peninsula. Oh yeah. So with something like that, um, I could do some field sorting to make sure like if you all want, you know, all of Gig Harbor's results at the top and then, then you want Henderson and then you want Peninsula, I could do some sorting in the fields to make sure that's how it looks when it runs. But yes, to answer the question, this query can be run for multiple high schools at once in one district. Um, I can also make that district prompt optional as well if people think that would be helpful, like if um, you wanna be able to run it for more than one district at a time. But it looks like based on the P223 report, you would always be running it for one district at a time was kind of my understanding. Well, I, th I think for me, I think it would be helpful because for accounting purposes, I think they, you know, I don't know. I usually send it all in one report up to my accounting office. And then they do whatever their magic to it. <laughs> Okay, so you're saying you want to be able to run it for more than one district at a time? Yes, please. District and high school. Okay, yeah, I'll make both of those prompts optional. And I, yeah, I see Hillary. I know you've had your hand up and I see you having a thumbs up too. Is yeah. that what you were going to suggest too? That that was part of my question. Yes, thank you so much for, for getting going on this. Um, my, I was written a BI report. Is that Power BI? Sorry, I'm still learning the stupid name of it. Um, and it runs from the regular billing query is my understanding. So I'm, a, and I was really excited to hear you talk about rounding because that was, has been just a complete and utter struggle. Um, cause my, my report runs really great and it pulls everybody, but, um, the rounding was the issue. And I think this would fix my last tiny little tweak that I need. Um, yeah. And so that, that did answer what I was going to talk about, I think. Yeah. And all the districts for sure, because um, in the power BI, I can just choose the district to, to make the report individually in there. So if this one had everyone, that would be ideal okay. for my purposes. Yeah. And I'm just curious, you mentioned power BI. Is that something that 
like your IT team at your college is developed for you locally or something? It was Caesar. Yeah, I need to shout out to Caesar Aguilar because he created it for me and has put up with my requests for edits and things. Um, I can try and share it if you want to. Oh, yeah. I was just curious because that's not something like we use here at the state board. We have some other BI mm. tools, but that's so when you said Power BI, I was like, oh, I wonder, like, I just was curious. <laughs> I'm assuming it's because that. it's in Teams and it's free. That's why we use it. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so I have a quick question. Um, so if we are like let's say we're looking at this one district that you populated with multiple high schools. So let's say I put this in Excel, it downloads as an Excel sheet. Um, if I wanna filter it, so for like um, the high school that says here, like Gig Harbor High School, it will say like the actual results for like the count in addition to the FTE. So it will like adjust itself. Does that make sense? Um, or it, will it all be like totals of everything? Well, I'm just trying to think, um, cause I know I set these up to be by, by the high school. Mm -hmm. And so, um, by the high school and the grade. So this is only like this 98.26 number is only for gig Harbor. Yeah. Cause you'll see that it changes once it gets down to peninsula. Okay. That's so great. Yeah, so that makes it one. easy. So I wasn't sure if it was that easy or more complicated. So that makes it a lot easier for like downloading and then, you know, saving the reports for certain like high schools and things. So that makes it a yeah. lot more simplified. And then I guess another question, um, you know, once you kind of like fix it up to your liking, when will this be usable? <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, so that was something when I, yeah, talked to Jamie and Stephanie and kind of demoed this query for them. Um, they were like, oh, this is great. You know, can you demo this at this meeting today to get your all's feedback um, before like making this available in production, essentially? So yeah, right now it's in PCD, which is our testing environment. Um, and all I really needed from you all, you know, kind of collectively was the go ahead, like, yes, we like this query, this would work for us, um, this suits our needs. And then essentially from there, I can just put in a request to have it migrated to production. Um, and I could even do that as soon as today, because we have two migration windows a week, they're on Monday, Wednesday, and then it wouldn't migrate to production until like tomorrow evening. So it'd be available like tomorrow evening slash Friday morning. Um, if you all feel good about yes, this. Please. And that's, yeah. And that's <laughs> not to say that, you know, once it migrates to production, there can't be tweaks. Like again, if somebody gives me feedback, that's like, Oh, I want this zip code field moved to the end. Like that's a very easy tweak that I could make, even if it's already migrated to production. I just want you guys to have the data that you know have the query that you need is in production as soon as possible so yeah I think we were waiting to demo it for you guys today get your feedback and then we can go from there yes thank you so much yeah mm -hmm. I would love to use it for this round of enrollment reports so <laughs> yeah I, if you couldn't tell I'm thrilled so thank I'll you I'm glad yeah well I, I was wanted to today. ask it yeah, Emily, I just wanted to ask a quick question to everyone, you know, as, as you and I and Jamie have been meeting on this, um, just a curiosity, is anyone actually filling in the P223 report student by student, putting in their VOC and um, academic FTE or is yes. <laughs> no, no, oh, we all, oh, people are? Okay. Yes. I was kind of curious who's doing that or if anyone still is. We okay, do. is that work? Um, but we have our, we work with our finance team. And so we just copy and paste the information from the Google or from the query report. And then um, our P, uh, form is actual, actually digitalized in Excel. So it does all the calculations on its own after we copy and paste everything. So we don't have to manually type in everything. That's yeah, great. I manually type in everything and uh, do all the calculations and everything. Our uh, school hasn't like done like the fancy power bi like hillary has um and so i've been doing it all manually it takes a lot of time a lot of energy um so 
yeah, this is literally revolutionary. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, thank you. I and so just kind of a further conversation on that point because um, Emily uh, is amazing. Thank you, Emily. I think on behalf of everyone's very excited about this. Um, but we had played around with um, figuring out a way to uh, incorporate, like putting the information into the P two two three. But the issue we were thinking about with that is, you know, OSPI could change the format, the form, and so then that would create a lot of. Um, and I'm not using the correct verbiage here, but <laughs> um, so we were thinking keeping it as is with the query to pull the information, and then you know it's definitely eliminating a lot of steps for folks. Um, but we did have, we did play around with um, putting it into, uh, and again, I'm like, I'm totally blanking out <laughs> of the right verbiage for this technical verbiage, but filtering it into the actual form. But then we, we saw issues with if OSPI at some point changes the form or needs to update it or something. So um, just wanted to, to make that comment there too. Um, any uh, like suggestions or um, before we do move this to production, any concerns as Emily had said, um, as we just wanted everybody's eyes on this first before we, we moved forward. Stephanie, should we get like a, like maybe some hands um, saying, yeah, like good to go, or so we can kind of get a better idea of how many people are in favor and don't have any edits. That's a good idea. Um, I'm trying to think the best way to cap like how to do that. <laughs> it doesn't have to be official, but it's just trying to gather like generally, like, yeah. Can you, can you do a poll real quick? If you want oh, to. hold up. Let me see. That's a good idea. <laughs> And you may want to ask for one response from each college. <laughs> yeah, um, Teresa. I... Yeah. I, well, do we even have? Oh, I don't even know if we have the poll set up in here. That's what I'm realizing. So Linda had mentioned if we can have the option by high school, by district, or all students combined in one report. And I think that's Right, Emily, that's what we would do, correct, from what I'm understanding, is we'd give all those options. Yes, so essentially I'm just going to make these last two prompts optional, so people will still be able to run it only filling in college and term, and then they will get back, like, all the districts, all the high schools, and then, of course, there's the option of you can just fill in the high school district, and then it'll give you the three or four or however many high schools that are only in that district. They'll all be in the same that one run of the query. Um, so yeah, basically we'll just have it to where these top two are the only required prompts and then I'll make these last two optional. All right, wonderful, thank you, thank you Emily. Different, so we don't have polls. I'm just gonna ask like, if we don't hear from you, we're gonna say it's a go. If you have strong feelings or want some additional questions answered or changes, please, T raise your hand now and talk or put it in the chat and we'll document it. Does that seem good, Stephanie? Sounds great. I like it because you can also use it for all different purposes, right? Because you can send this as like grade reports too. I like the ability to see the grade. Mm -hmm. So that's really nice too. And that'll just be blank if it's obviously during the quarter um, for students. Yeah, I just went ahead and moved zip code to the end. It was bugging me how it was like <laughs> here in the middle of all these other, you know, kind of more related fields. So I just put moved it to the end and then it kind of that kind of matches where it is in the P223 report too. It's kind of like that last column. Um, so if nobody has objections to that. And then, yeah, I tried to keep this in the order that this spreadsheet was in. Yeah. Emily, are there any, sorry, are there oh, any plans to like 
standardize the next step so we're not all doing our own things still do like make, make a make a report that doesn't ne not necessarily go to the form um but just as a standardized report to run and just send like in power bi or whatever you guys are using um so, so i think that's what stephanie had just mentioned about that was something oh. we talked about as far as so we don't have power bi we have like bi publisher is one of our tools we can use um but i think the concern with that is like what if we do all of that to get things populated for this and then something changes like yeah with who's requesting the data and then we have to like completely redo the report um so i think we thought we would just have the data in the query and then it sounded like a lot of people were just kind of exporting this to excel mm -hmm. and then again what you would export would actually have like students names and stuff right. and it doesn't have it but then yeah. it sounded like a lot of people were just kind of printing that and like attaching it to this just to kind of keep that easier but then they were just like filling in this part yeah at the top we had um, we had gotten quote permission to not use that exact form so it seems like if we're still sending the right information that they need that that I mean that form hasn't changed in what 25 years so I mean ultimately <laughs> so well, I don't know that you know they're still yeah gonna, unless, unless they totally revamp the billing situation which is going to be a bigger issue so yeah. So thank you, Hillary, for that. So yeah, we, as Emily said, you know, we, we've been trying to figure out like, do we go to that next step um, or we just leave it like this and then folks can, can kind of finish the final step there. Um, you know, I think there's opportunity here. We, we ran this by Tim. I don't know if Tim's on the, the line right now, or if he jumped back on. Not yet. Um, not yet. Okay. Um, but thanks. <laughs> but we just kind of ran it by him, this idea. And he was, you know, obviously he's, he's thrilled too to reduce, um, you know, workload, you know, why not? Um, and so I think there's opportunity to also have conversations about the P223 form. Um, can't make any promises, but, you know, um, it is definitely outdated, as you <laughs> said, it's been around for years and years and years. And so, you know, can we edit it? You know, so there's, there's kind of some conversations going on already. Um, and so any, I just wanted to say that, uh, so that's part of it too, is maybe let's not touch this piece. Um, because, you know, as we're looking at the RSEVF, maybe we look also at the P223 form. Um, so just, I'll, I'll leave that there, but that's kind of, kind of where we're going with that. And you know Thank what we, you. we can also do, um, I've just seen that message about getting this to Anne at South Puget and maybe, I, I don't know what the best way to do that is, but I do think maybe something in the listserv, maybe Stephanie, that we can share yep. out for mm -hmm. those that couldn't be here. And then also this is recorded. So we'll make sure yep. to, the, to let people know that like, hey, this is what we talked about. Here's the recording to make sure everyone can check in who's not here. That's a great idea. I just spoke with Ann, or I sent some screenshots during the session, and I actually shared them with Ann, and she said yes. She'd vote yes. Love it. <laughs> awesome. But that is a good idea, because there are, there. I know a lot of folks aren't on here that would probably love to see this or have have feedback or input. Um, so maybe we will send something out to the, the listserv, uh, and we can we can get a little bit more feedback if that sounds good. All right. Can you guys go back to the spreadsheet or the report sheet? Thanks. So the query or the this? Um, so the student's name is not included in this? It it will be. It was just taken okay. out. Yeah, and student okay. IDs. Okay. Yeah, and, I just... and is, there, is there the ability to add the student's email address? Uh, yeah, we could add that. Is that because something? I can, well, yeah. because I can see us using, so we have over 3,000 students. I see us using this uh, report for multiple uses. And so this that's one of the things that's a problem for us is even though we try to go into our CRM and run this, you know, get the data and the information to email our students, um, on the billing reports and, and this that we use frequently for certain things, 
I think it would be really um, good for us to have the student's email address included in this report. Okay, yeah, that'll probably be, if, if I add that field, I'll probably add that at the very end here because it's not- oh, yeah. that's fine, that everybody needs it, I get yeah. it. So then yeah, just, perfect, yeah. thank you. I mm -hmm. would appreciate it. Okay, yeah, that's good feedback, thank you. All right, and Heather, looks like Heather has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, what does it look like when a student withdraws um, on the report? Like, what do the numbers look like? Does it still count their their credits in uh, in the formula? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I would like to do some more testing with that, like basically find a student that that did happen <laughs> in a given term and just kind of see what their data looks like um before i answer you definitively i just <laughs> i just know the other thing too is right now so i am in pcd which is our testing environment and this only gets refreshed with like real time data from production once a month um and so whereas when this query gets to production and you're running it you will be getting data like live data and so i'm almost wondering if like they just since it'll be live, if if the system is seeing them as having withdrawn, they just like won't even be included in it. Um, but again, I don't want to tell you that definitively until I look yeah. into that more. What yeah, are what is, my, let me ask you this? Like, what is your hope that happens with students who have well, withdrawn? Like, how just, do you just with the you... billing report that that I've been working with? You know, um, I've always had to go in and and do an adjustment when they've withdrawn to the number of credits. Okay. Uh, cause it would still show that the, the student was enrolled in that number of credits, but their FTE had been adjusted down. So I'm just wondering if that is something that, you know, I'm still going to have to do within this report or if it's going to catch that or not. Okay. Yeah. Let me look into that and then, um, get back to you. And I can also let Stephanie and Jamie know if they want to send out like an email or something to the listserv just so that I'm not just responding to you, Heather, because other people might have that question. Yeah, thank you. thank you, Heather. And thank you, Emily. Um, Yeah, I'll, I'll pause a minute before I send out communication to the listserv until Emily has a chance to kind of troubleshoot a little bit so that I can put all that information and send it out to everybody um, just so everyone has that, that feedback. And um, if that sounds good. And I, I did see uh, Maria Christina had a comment um, and I think it's a really good question. Will these changes hurt anything that colleges already have in place? We send our reports to each school with a click of the button and it has all the P223 info that schools need. Uh, just wanted to make sure. So I, I think I can safely say this. Um, if you have a good process in, in place and you're using the Running Start Billing Report, um, it's working for you. Uh, we're not going to touch any of that, right, Emily? They won't have anything to do with, with what's already set up with the Running Start Billing Report, if that's what you're using. And feel free to continue to use this process. Um, we just want to make sure that you know, if you'd like to use this and ha ease your process, if this makes sense for you, um, please, that's that's what we're trying to do is just help folks out. But if you already have something in place and, and Jamie and Emily, feel free to jump in here. Um, but I think I, I feel pretty confident saying, please continue to do what you're doing if it works for you. Yeah, on the policy side, that's totally fine. Like we were just wanting to respond to a lot of questions and, or I, well, requests. So that's what we have today. But yeah, if you have something in your business practices, we're not asking that everyone commit to doing the same exact thing. At least not now with CTC Link. Don't quote me, you know, President <laughs> of the ultimate say, but right now we're good. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, and that the the regular QCS SR RS billing query, like that is still available um, in CTC Link. That particular query has a lot more fields. I mean, I would be scrolling over to the right for a very long time <laughs> if we had that query pulled up. Um, so yeah, I think this was just kind of born out of an idea of like paring down some of that data and then adding some of the other data that's needed for P223. But yeah, that query is definitely still available and if I'm sure folks need it and are using it for other things. So yeah, definitely what works for you, I would say keep doing that. Wonderful. All right, any other questions uh, or comments, suggestions for Emily? All 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Emily. You're amazing. Uh, so appreciate you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Love thanks it. for yeah. having me. All right. Thanks. Wonderful. Some hand clapping here. All right. <laughs> so I think we have Tim back on the, the line here and we just have about uh, six minutes left. Um, so let me go ahead and pull my my screen back up. But yeah, Q&A, any, any questions, comments? Feel free to ask. I put in the chat, um, could you potentially put the link for the listserv to make sure that we're getting all of the right emails? Yep, I can get that for you right now. Perfect, thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Okay. Any questions? Okay, well, we certainly can wrap up. Um, so our next session, the, the last session that we have on our books for this school year uh, will be June 11th, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., so the same time frame. Uh, this one will be, we'll have a little bit of um, uh, presentation, but mostly it'll be open discussion and Q&A um, to help support folks. And I do see um, a hand raised. Heather, go ahead. Yeah, we needed to get that one question answered regarding the like homeschool students and when to have them active at the high school. Thank you. Yes. So, Tim, <laughs> thank you for joining us again. There was a question earlier um, that we we kind of needed your expertise on. Um, and I'm, I'm forgetting who asked the question. Um, do you remember? I don't remember who it was, yeah. but um, the, the question was the a homeschool student is coming in. They want to uh, the high schools are are putting them in for to start in the fall, but the homeschool student is wanting to take a class during the summer. And when do the when should the high schools activate the students um, so that they can take summer quarter classes? They need to be activated before the fall. So they, they need to get enrolled for the summer order through the school or the school district. So that that those conversations need to be happening now. They wouldn't be able to um, be on the, the rolls, if you will, and generating funding unless they're activated for summer term. And then I kind of have like a follow-up question to that because I had one high school um who there was a private school student mm -hmm. um kind of the same thing but the private school wasn't going to be releasing them um for the summer. Need, yeah they don't need to be released from the private school they they can enroll concurrently if you will um with between the private school and the public school there's no need for them to be released in any fashion right right all right thank you yeah all right any other questions Okay, well, thank you everyone so much for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you, Emily, uh, for, for being on here. Incredible um, working with both of you. And uh, we look forward to our next uh, session. And we will follow up on the listserv with the updates to the query and just um, information to share for everybody with everybody. Thank you.